so the basic idea here is um, to try and view Fracton models as a network of defects sitting inside a 3 plus 1 dimensional TQFT. And hopefully this will make a lot more sense by the end of the talk. But the basic idea is to uh, sort of split up space in terms of this so-called stratification. So we'll have volumes, which are called three strata, uh, sort of planes that are called two strata, and then uh, lines which live at the intersections of these surfaces called one strata, and then zero strata here. And to each three strata, we'll assign a three plus one D TQFT. To the two strata, we'll assign a boundary condition over the adjacent three strata TQFTs, and so on. So at the one strata, will be a boundary condition over the two strata and three strata, and similarly for the zero strata. Now, a lot goes into this construction, so I'll try to give uh, the absolute minimum necessary background in order to understand these models and give a very explicit construction for the X cube model uh, from a defect network. All right, so before moving on, I want to say thanks to my collaborators. Uh, Danny Bolnash is in the audience, and then it was also done in collaboration with uh, Abhinav Prem, Kevin Slagle, and Dominic Williamson. And I should say, I also have not properly referenced my slides. I tried to get the important references in, um, but I do apologize. Okay, so first, um, I should talk about the motivation. You know, why are we interested in these fracton models? Well, one reason to be interested in them is they realize exotic phases of matter. So as Zhang Wan was talking about this morning, and Xie just previously, um, they were saying we can have uh, particle excitations which don't occur at the end of string operators, which is a very exotic possibility for uh, topological orders. Okay, so they realize exotic phases of matter. And they also test our conventional understanding of gapped phases. So at least naively, they don't appear like they can be realized as a three plus one dimensional TQFT. Yet our naive intuition says that at zero temperature and zero energy, all gap phases should behave like a topological quantum field theory. So how do we reconcile that fact with uh, fracton models? Um, and then the other motivation is for potential applications in quantum computing. So perhaps as a stable quantum memory. I believe this was the original interest that motivated uh, Zhang Wan to discover these models. And uh, feel free to ask questions at any time. Okay, so before moving on, I should review uh, a little bit about topological order in two and three dimensions as these are the necessary ingredients in order to build our three plus one dimensional defect networks. So when I say a two dimensional topological order, you should be thinking of uh, some spin model in two dimensions, or uh, here's a more practical example, which is the quantum Hall effect, it consists of electrons confined to a plane in the presence of a strong magnetic field. And a given filling fractions or electron density, sorry, you'll realize a topological phase. Salient features of a topological order are fractalized excitations. So these are excitations that cannot occur in our three plus one dimensional universe by themselves. They're also called anions. If we place the system on a manifold with a non-trivial topology, it'll realize a robust ground state degeneracy. And in particular, uh, there is no local order parameter that can actually detect which ground state you're in. Okay, so that's sort of encoded in this equation here, up to exponentially small terms. All right, and we know many theoretical examples of two plus one D topological orders um, and have a few uh, practical or realistic experiments that actually uh, realize these topological orders as well. So one is the quantum Hall effect, which is presented here. Um, a recently uh, investigated phase is this Kataev spin liquid, which was theoretically proposed by Alexei Kataev over 20 years ago and has um, potentially non-abelian anions sitting inside of it, and there are candidate materials which actually may realize it now. More uh, mathematical models are the toric code, which Shay mentioned in her talk, and I'll actually explain in my talk now. And then more general models are these uh, quantum doubles or string net models, which are exactly solvable commuting projector models that allow us to understand many universal properties of 2D topological order. In three dimensions, we have much less uh, or much fewer experimental realizations of 3D topological orders. Um, but we do have many uh, theoretical models, so so-called digraph would engage theory and these Walker-Wan models. And so today, I'll um, 
go over the Torah code and Z2 digraph wouldn't engage theory in the context of these defect networks. So in 3D, generically what you expect are uh, loop excitations that live at the boundary of membranes and particle excitations which can move freely through three-dimensional space and potentially have non-trivial statistics with the loop-like excitations. Okay, so now I want to contrast uh, 3 plus 1D topological orders with fracton models or fracton phases. Um, <clears throat> and uh, in particular, talk about the phenomenology of these models. Okay, so one of the sort of key features of a fracton phase is that they uh, realize uh, mobility constraints on the particles. So you could have um, particles which are restricted to planes or surfaces. We call these planons. We encountered them earlier today. Uh, those surfaces don't necessarily need to be uh, stacked straight in one direction through space, but they could be curved and even self-intersect if you really want them to. Uh, linons tend to, well, they, their, their mobility is only along paths or lines in three-dimensional space, and a helpful way to think about them is living at the intersection of uh, two surfaces. Okay, so we call them linons or linions. And then the last type of particle you can have is a uh, fracton, which is an immobile particle, and you can either think about it as living at intersections of three surfaces, or uh, the perspective we'll be taking later today is that they live in these uh, volumes of our defect network. All right, so um, beyond the mobility constraints of the particles, we also have this sub-extensive ground state degeneracy. So the, ground state, the number of ground states in the system will grow exponentially in the system size, which is not something that we would see in a 3 plus 1D topological order. And I will say there are many classes of exactly solvable models that do exist. And one nice thing about this defect network construction is that it allows you to construct many more. So it really gives us a way to construct many of these uh, fracton models very efficiently. All right, and typically these fracton phases uh, come in two types, which are distinguished by the mobility of the particles. So your model will either have mobile particles or it will not. If it has mobile particles, such as linons or planons, then we call it a type one fracton order. And if it has no mobile particles, um, then we'll call it a type two fracton order. And typically those excitations will live at the boundary of fractal shaped operators up to some gauge degrees of freedom. Are there any questions at this point? Okay. So I, did, I said I did a poor job at referencing, but I did want to mention a few of the important references. So first, um, I think the first instance of these models being studied in the literature is by Claudio Shimon back in 2005. However, it was not in the context of fractons, it was in the context of studying quantum glass, as shown here. It wasn't until uh, really Zhongwan introduced us to these models in his PhD thesis when he was trying to develop uh, stable quantum memories uh, in three dimensions. <clears throat> okay, and then following uh, Zhang Wan's PhD, he went to MIT and worked with uh, Liang Fu and Sagar Vijay and gave us a nice understanding in term, uh, of these fracton phases in terms of gauging subsystem symmetries. Um, okay, and then there are many other references that I'm not referencing here. There's a huge body of work that includes uh, field theory constructions and gapless models in two dimensions and, and many, many more. Okay, this work is really, really inspired by and based off of uh, these three papers here. Um, so what these three papers showed, well, these were the first two, the upper two, and then it was reviewed very well in this Cajunet paper, that's really where I learned it. Um, what they showed is that you could recover fracton models by taking uh, layers of two plus one D topological orders and adding an interaction along the intersection of those layers um, so that you drive the system through a phase transition, do some perturbation theory, and then find a fracton model at the end of the day. Okay, and that's already very close to a defect picture because it's, it's, it's basically saying take layers of 2D topological orders and then make them interact uh, with one another. Okay, so this is, I don't expect you to read this text, but this is one paragraph from this CageNet paper which basically describes in words the defect picture. So they're describing this figure nine here, 
which uh, consists of 2D Tor codes on the planes. So I've only shown two foliation directions, the XY plane and the uh, YZ plane, but there's also XZ planes that are not displayed. And what they say is that they add an interaction to the Hamiltonian, which generates these four Tor code anions, and they view those as being attached by a loop sitting in 3 plus 1D, and then proliferate that over all 3 plus 1D space, or condense it, as we would say in physics. And if you look at this knowing about 3 plus 1D TQFTs, such as the Tor code model, you can recognize these strings that are sitting inside these volumes as uh, 3D Tor code degrees of freedom, which are bound to 2D Tor code degrees of freedom. And so that's really where the inspiration of this defect network came from. <clears throat> okay. So before describing how we realize the X cube model from a network of topological defects, I want to review the X cube model. Uh, just discussed in Shay's talk, so I'll try to be brief. So this, li this model lives on the cubic lattice. Uh, so these are the edges of a cubic lattice. And on every edge, we have um, one two-dimensional Hilbert space, as shown here. And then we have four types of terms. Um, from, from these four terms, we construct this Hamiltonian, just the negative sum of those four terms. The A term is a Q, so it acts on the boundaries of this um, cube here uh, by poly X matrices. And I've written poly X well, poly X, Y, and Z matrices at the top of the slide. Okay, so this is a 12-body term uh, that acts on all of the edges around a cube. Similarly, there are three kinds of vertex terms. Here I've drawn the picture for one of them. So this is a vertex term which lies in the XZ plane, and we apply, when we uh, apply it on this vertex, it hits these four terms with a sigma Z operator. And then these two other terms are just uh, symmetry rotated versions of that BXZ operator. Okay, and then you can analyze this model and you'll find this very exotic ground state degeneracy, which is two to the LX plus two to the LY plus two to the LZ minus three. And this minus three is quite exotic. So that's basically what distinguishes it from being decoupled 2D toric codes. We know that the 2D toric codes must talk to one another in some way in order to account for this minus three here. All right, so let's discuss the fundamental excitations of this model. So here's the uh, four terms appearing in the Hamiltonian, and the lattice on the upper right. And we should be able to understand the fundamental excitations by figuring out how these four terms are violated um, at finitely many points in our three-dimensional model. All right, so one way we can do that is by looking at a membrane which intersects uh, a bunch of the edges of the cubic lattice. And every time it intersects an edge in a plane, we apply a sigma z operator. So the sigma z will commute with these, sorry, this laser pointer. This um, sigma z will, of course, commute with these three B terms on the right, which are all built out of poly Z matrices. Um, but it will anti-commute with some of the cubes that uh, uh, occur at the corners of this membrane operator. At all places far away from the corners that will commute with the cube terms, but the corners that only overlaps on one edge, and so it violates that particular cube term. And you find um, this particular membrane operator will create four excitations. Okay, so those four excitations can be created and annihilated in quadruples. And then you can ask, what about their mobility? So we could try to take uh, this particle in the upper right corner of that square patch and try to move it. And what you'll find is you won't be able to move it without creating additional excitations. So that's why it has a mobility constraint Every time you try to move it, you'll create more and more excitations. They're coming. They're violations of these B operators. OK, so, um, so that's why isolated corners of this membrane operator, these excitations created by this membrane operator, are called fractons. <clears throat> 
Now, pairs of fractons uh, turn into planons in this model. So one way to see that is we can just apply this membrane operator uh, right next to it. And we'll find that the uh, two excitations that were previously on the right side of that membrane operator will move over in the system. And similarly, we can apply that membrane operator down into the PowerPoint slide. And we'll find that that pair of fractons can move back into the plane. So fracton dipoles, or pairs of fractons, uh, make up planons. All right, so what about the linons? Uh, that's this slide. So we talked about how we can violate this cube term that results in fra uh, fractons and planons. Violating these um, vertex terms uh, results in linons. So here we apply a string operator, which lives on the edges of a cubic lattice. And uh, we want it to commute with the cube term. So we use the sigma x operators here. And um, so if you apply them in a straight line, you'll find that they locally commute with the Hamiltonian. However, when we terminate this line, it will violate one of these three terms. And similarly, if you try to turn a corner, oh, sorry, the reference didn't show up. This is from Zhang Wan's paper and Sagar and Liang, these pictures. Um, <clears throat> so if you try to turn a corner, you'll find that you actually create an excitation every time you try to turn a corner. And that's why these are called linons. If we keep trying to turn corners, it will generate more and more excitations. We also notice that there are three types corresponding to the three different terms that we can violate. And these uh, live in the three coordinate directions of the cubic lattice. Okay. Moreover, um, one can check that those three linons that live in these three coordinate directions can all fuse to the vacuum. So you can create triples of these linons out of the vacuum. Right. And because of this, uh, pairs of linons can be turned into planons. So if you look at this picture, when you try to turn that corner, you'll exchange this MC linon and then violate no Hamiltonian terms at this corner. So linon dipoles also generate another flavor of planons. Okay, and with that, we get to the outline of my talk. So we have this somewhat exotic lattice model, and we want to understand from a TQFT perspective, how can we realize some of this phenomenology and these excitations? Okay, so the outline will be review topological order in two plus one dimensions, which I already did, and then start talking about the uh, TOR code, which is a Z2 topological order, and then defects and gap boundaries in two plus one dimensions, as a warm-up example for defects in three plus one dimensions. And this will all be done with the Tor code again. And then we'll do Tor code in three plus one dimensions, and then get to the defect network construction for the X cube model as defects sitting inside a three plus one uh, dimensional Tor code. All right, any questions at this point? All right, so a little bit more about anions and uh, topological order in two plus one dimensions. So um, the claim is that a topological, the, the universal data of a topological phase in two plus one dimensions is encoded in the exchange statistics and uh, fusion rules of the excitations. So what we're used to is having bosons and fermions. If we take a pair of bosons and exchange them, pick up a plus sign. If we take a pair of fermions and exchange them, we'll pick up a minus sign. Uh, anions are quite a bit different. If you uh, exchange a pair of anions, you'll pick up uh, an abel a phase. Uh, that's what we call abelian anions. If we have non-abelian anions, then you'll find that you pick up a unitary transformation on the uh, degenerate ground states. OK, and then the braiding statistics cannot change within a given phase, which is why we expect this data to uh, encode universal properties of a given gap phase of matter. OK, moreover, um, these systems are all locally look, well, for a given topological phase, locally look identical. The spectrum will look like this. You'll have a ground state uh, if there's no excitations. If you have many excitations present, you may have several uh, ground states, but it will always be finite. And there'll be a finite gap to the lowest energy excited states. What do you mean by universal properties? 
Yeah, so the belief is that the uh, universal properties of a topological order are described by a modular tensor category. That's like the gauge invariant quantity that you expect. Okay, so gauge invariant quantity is like an interchangeable yes. way to say this. So the list of things that you mentioned is like part of it. Just part of it, yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, I'm not going to give a complete introduction to topological order. Um, okay. So the ground states are locally uh, indistinguishable, which is you know, why many people want to use them for building a quantum computer. So how do we describe these systems mathematically? Well, mathematically, they're described by a unitary modular tensor category. Again, I'm not going to give a definition of this. I'm definitely not the right person, but I will describe it in the way that we use it today. So a uh, modular tensor category will consist of a list of objects, which are our particles or excitations in the system. And they'll carry labels, A, B, C, and so on. Um, in this case, they live in two dimensions because we're doing two plus one dimensional topological order. And so we have points that are labeled by the topological charge that they carry. All right, if we bring two of these topological charges together, we can do a local measurement which will tell us uh, what their local topological charge is. And that's what we call a fusion rule. Okay. And then there are several physical constraints, uh, such as there should be a trivial particle, which is the collection of local excitations in the theory. And generally, we label it by the vacuum. And all charges are invariant under fusion with the vacuum. Similarly, there should always be an antiparticle for every particle. Right. Now, uh, usually we use a diagrammatic calculus to describe these systems. And the diagrams that we build up are all built out of these trivalent vertices. Question? Yeah, just on the previous slide, could you remind me what the tensor product and the, and the direct sum uh, So the tensor product is just uh, a way of encoding this fusion rule. Um, so, yeah, some people just denote it with the times. So that's just bringing the yes, it's taking two, two uh, well-separated anions close together and then performing a local measurement in order to determine their total topological charge. So when they're far away, there's no local measurement that can tell you what ground state they share. Any other questions? OK. And that, that's basically this picture here. So here, you can think of this as a space-time picture where we have uh, two particles, A and B, sitting in two-dimensional space. And then as time goes on, which you can think of as going up the slide, those two anions come together and fuse into this anion C as determined by a measurement. OK. And these pictures we can think of as living inside uh, a vector space which is labeled by the anions which uh, sit at the line terminations. Okay, so modular tensor category is a braided fusion category with additional properties. Uh, fusion category uh, has this uh, object called the F symbol, which tells you how you can relate uh, different ways of tensoring together these local Hilbert spaces. Physically, we can create these three anions in two different ways, and we expect a unitary transformation to relate the associated Hilbert spaces. That unitary transformation we call the F symbol. These F symbols are subject to some locality constraints by these diagrams, which end up being encoded in the Pentagon equation. And um, yeah, one disclaimer I have is that I will drop arrows on all these diagrams for the most part in my talk. The last piece of data we need is the braiding, which is just the process of taking a pair of these anions and pushing them around one another. And we encode that data in another symbol, which is called the R symbol. OK, so this, um, as far as we're concerned today, this is just a linear relation on these diagrams. Um, yeah. Can we confuse into like, some new particle C, a bunch of different particles? Uh, 
given by like A cross B equals summation over a bunch of C's. How do you know which particle they will fuse into? Uh, you have to perform a local measurement in order to determine which particle it is. Um, so can you say a priori? So you, can you never say a priori that a and B are always going to fuse into a single particle? Like, does it have to? Not, be not unless you know more information about the state. So if you knew that A and A star were created from the vacuum, right. then you for sure know that they'll fuse back to the vacuum. But if you care create two particles far apart from one another and fuse the two that weren't pair created together, you won't be able to tell uh, what they fuse into until you've performed a measurement. So you need to know the super selection uh, You need to know the super selection sector, that's correct. Any other questions? Okay. So this is really where I wanted to get to. There are some important gauge invariant quantities, which we use to um, understand some of the excitations. The one on the left is called the S matrix, which encodes data about the exchange statistics of our anions. You can tell there's a double braid there. And the other one is a diagonal matrix that consists of these uh, topological spin values, which is uh, morally telling you what happens when you rotate your system by 2 pi, what phase your anion will pick up. So we call theta the topological spin. All right. So now we can talk about, well, we can begin to talk about uh, gap boundaries in two plus one dimensions. And then we'll use what we learned here in order to build gap boundaries in three plus one dimensions. All right, so gap boundaries, what are they useful for? Well, they help us to describe boundaries from a topological order to another topological order. Um, for example, that topological order could be trivial, um, or it could be non-trivial, and you may have some exotic defect that lives between them. Okay, and one general way to describe gap boundaries, at least in the models that I'm discussing today, is through uh, anion condensation. And so the idea is you have some topological order here, um, and you used to have this topological order on the right-hand side, but then you added some uh, local interactions which forced some of the particles to be isomorphic to one another. So they were previously distinguishable particles, but once we add those interactions, they become isomorphic. And in the mathematical language, we uh, condense this anion A. Okay, and then between these two systems, you'll have a gap boundary here whose data is also described by the anions that you're condensing. Okay. And uh, similarly, a defect sitting inside a topological order uh, can be thought of as a boundary uh, for the folded system. So if you take this uh, uh, two-dimensional topological order and fold it along that zigzag, you'll find that it is some gapped boundary to the vacuum, a gap boundary on top of a product of the system with itself. And, uh, and so we should be able to describe that gap boundary, as I just said, by an algebra object or the anions that condense. And so generically, we should expect to be able to describe uh, defects in 2 plus 1D by some sort of condensation. All right, any questions about this slide? Can you elaborate on the folding procedure? Yes, so, so um, if we agree that gapped boundaries of two-dimensional topological orders can be, gap boundaries to vacuum can be described by condensing an algebra then we can take this system and, like a book, fold it on itself. Then we know that it's, again, a gap boundary to vacuum. And so we expect that folded system to also be described by condensation. Okay, or the defects to be described by condensation. Does that clear it? Okay. Uh, any other questions? I saw there was one. Defects yes. can be fused with one another? Sorry? Defects can be fused with one another? Before, from they can be, if you bring them close to one another. But the, so these defects won't necessarily be invertible. Okay. Uh, um, but, uh, they cannot be braided in general. They cannot be braided, as far as I know, when they're not invertible. Does this correspond to what you said in the beginning, that they somehow do not move? Pardon? 
You said in the beginning that defects, unlike other particles, they do not move. Um, yes, yeah, so in 2 plus 1D, all of the excitations that you could have on this defect can always be brought off the defect. So that's special to 2 plus 1D. In 3 plus 1 dimensions, that won't always be the case. So you will end up with these mobility constraints. So this mobility constraint has this the fact that they cannot debrade, or, or that's separate? Uh, I don't know if it's related. Okay, maybe we can discuss after. Any other questions? All right. So the mathematics of condensation is pretty complicated. I just wanted, at least complicated for me. Um, so here I just want to give you a flavor of it. Uh, so the idea is we have some, uh, where is this thing? There we go. Some braided fusion category C. And then we find a new braided fusion category C mod A by condensing this object. And by condensing, I mean we add uh, morphisms to our theory which make this uh, object A isomorphic to the vacuum. Okay, and physically this tells us that we are now treating this anion A as a particle which can be locally created from the vacuum and locally annihilated. All right, and I'll give an example of this in just a little bit. Okay, and as I said, condensation can be used to describe gap boundaries and defects, and that will carry through to the three plus one dimensional system as well. So uh, one important thing to note is that we cannot condense an arbitrary anion. Um, so for example, the vacuum always has to have trivial topological spin, which is encoded in this diagram, and it also has to have trivial uh, exchange statistics. So if we add an isomorphism between our particle A and the vacuum, um, then we can use this diagram here to add this twist, pull that dot around the twist, and turn it into a twist of A, and we'll, um, you know, again using this diagram, or the fact that the left side is equal to the right side, tells us that the A particle must have trivial topological spin. And there's a similar diagram you can draw for the exchange statistics of A. It says it has to have uh, trivial statistics as well. Okay, so objects that braid, um, so also by studying diagrams like this, you will find or discover that um, objects which braid non-trivially with the particle you're trying to condense uh, will become confined in the condensed theory, and objects which braid trivially with it remain deconfined and still sit inside the condensed theory. Okay, so that's what's described here. So if we have uh, any object B, we can consider this process where we do a double braid of B with A. This green line should be labeled A. And if we find that the diagram is equal to the one on the right, then uh, B will remain deconfined in the condensed theory um, or remain in excitation of the condensed theory. Uh, similarly, if we find that the, braid, the double braid of A with B is not equal to the identity on A and B, uh, then B will become confined or it will turn into a defect of the condensed theory. And I should say, I'm assuming that A here is abelian, which means I do not actually, I'll never have lines that connect these two diagrams. Okay, and then the last thing to note is that in the condensed theory, the object B in the parent theory becomes isomorphic to B tensor A in the condensed theory. Any questions at this point? All right, so let's do an example and understand how some of this machinery works. So here is the 2D Tor code. It lives on the square lattice in two spatial dimensions. Um, you can put it on any lattice, but square lattice is convenient. So on each edge, we have a qubit or a two-dimensional Hilbert space. And then there are two types of terms that occur in the Hamiltonian, a plaquette term, which consists of the product of sigma x's around a plaquette, and then a vertex term, which consists of a product of sigma z's around a vertex. And you can tell that whenever these uh, terms overlap, the um, active terms in each uh, plaquette or vertex term overlap on two edges at least which means they commute. All right, so then we can understand the excitations in this system. 
it turns out there are uh, two string operators, which again correspond to uh, ways of violating either the plucket term or the vertex term, or both of them. So if we have a string of sigma x operators that terminates at some point, this will violate one of the vertex terms, but no more. Similarly, if we have a string of sigma z operators, it will violate one of the plucket terms, one of the plucket terms at each termination. Okay, so those uh, generate two of our uh, three particles. We call them E and M. If we put these two particles, E and M, together, that gives us a third kind of particle in the system, which turns out to be a fermion. Okay, and the E and M particles are bosons, which means they are candidates uh, for condensation. Okay, and here I've just listed out uh, the data of toric code. So here are the fusion rules. Um, if you take E and M as the generators of the fusion rules, you find a Z2 times Z2 fusion algebra. The associators are all trivial, and the R symbols are listed here, the non-trivial R symbols. Okay, so E and M are both condensable. Let's select one and condense it. I'm going to take E. So here's E. Um, by looking at these braids, what you'll find is that E braids non-trivially with M and psi. So in the condensed theory, these will become defects, or they'll become confined excitations, and we throw them away. Uh, e braids trivially with itself, and so that remains uh, deconfined, but it's really part of the condensate. So it's proliferated over all of space. So if we go to our picture here, I have 2D Tor code on the left, which has the trivial particle psi, E, and M. And then I have the condensed theory on the right-hand side. So in the condensed theory, E is isomorphic to the trivial particle, and psi and M are confined, so they actually get removed. Said so another way, the E excitation, which is a finite energy excitation on the left side of the system, um, becomes a no-cost excitation on the right-hand side because it's condensed. The numbers of E's are not conserved on the right side of the system. Okay, and if we try to take an M particle, which is an excitation on the left side, and move it to the right side, we'll find that as we drag it over to the right side, there'll be a linear cost in energy with distance from the boundary, and so it becomes linearly confined and pushed back onto the boundary. And because M fused with E is psi, uh, psi and M become isomorphic on this boundary. Okay, any questions? If not, I will continue. Okay, so now let's use condensation to understand defects in 2 plus 1D topological order. So here's the Tor code on the left, a Tor code on the right, and then a gray region down the center, which is a defect, described by condensing these anions. This is a diagonal condensation. We're condensing uh, the E from the left side with the E from the right side, the M from the left side with the M from the right side, and similarly for psi. And so what this tells you is that if you were to bring an M particle close to this boundary, you could pair create this pair of Ms for free, annihilate them on the left side, and use that to shuttle M over to the right side. So what you find is actually just the trivial invertible defect where these anions can freely pass through. Okay, here's another example. Um, except now I'm condensing a slightly different set of bosons. So here I'm condensing E with M and M with E. And so if you do the same calculation, what you'll find is that as you bring M across, the bound, across this defect, it'll turn into E. And as you bring E across this defect, it'll turn into M. Uh, but psi is left unchanged. Question? Yeah, okay. exactly. And, and really the right way to think about this is along that gray boundary, I've folded the two systems up a little bit and I'm condensing a, across the one-dimensional boundary there. Yes? It, it's uh, not the same as condensing psi because it's an E uh, from one Torah code with an M from a different Torah code. 
Good question, though. Okay. So, condensation tells you uh, which anions can and cannot pass through uh, the one dimensional defect. All right. Um, so, before building an interesting three dimensional uh, defect network, I wanted to give a fairly trivial one, which just consists of layers of 2D Torah codes, which was also mentioned in Shay's talk. Um, <clears throat> and so, this is a, a trivial planon model. So each, each layer consists of particles, 1, E, M, and Psi, and we have um, one set of those per layer. Okay. Now, in order to get a more interesting model, what I'll do is fill in the bulk with a three-dimensional topological order and make that topological order interact with these uh, two-dimensional layers via some condensation process. So the three-dimensional topological order that I'm going to use for this today is just the 3D Tor code model. Okay, so the 3D Tor code model um, lives on the cubic lattice, um, <clears throat> and we have one uh, qubit or a two-dimensional Hilbert space per site, and then the Hamiltonian looks very similar to the 2D Tor code. So there's a plaquette term for every plaquette, which consists of sigma x matrices around the boundary of a plaquette. And then on every vertex, we have a product of sigma z matrices across on every edge that touches that vertex. And one can, again, check that these two terms commute with one another. All right, what about violations of these terms? Well, um, if we want a term that violates the vertex term, a natural choice is a string operator of sigma x's, which is what I've shown here on the left. So, um, of course, sigma x's commute with sigma x, so you won't violate the plaquette term with the string operator, um, but whenever it terminates, it will violate the vertex term that it's uh, terminating adjacent to. So here it's violating this vertex term. Uh, similarly, we can have violations of these plaquette terms, um, which, gen which are given by uh, boundaries of membrane operators. So here's a membrane operator, which is intersecting the links of this cubic lattice. And every time it intersects a link of that cubic lattice, we apply a sigma z term. Sigma z will, of course, commute with this vertex term, but it will anti-commute with this uh, plaquette term every time it crosses an odd number of these edges. So here we violate a linear number of these plaquette terms, which is uh, linear in the distance linear in the perimeter of the membrane operator. All right. In terms of pictures, um, we can create these E particles in pairs out of the vacuum. In order to distinguish it from the uh, 2 plus 1 detour code, I'm going to put a tilde on all the three-dimensional particles. So here's E tilde being created in pairs. Similarly, uh, we have M tilde loop excitations which live at the boundaries of these membranes, and I'll draw them like this. Um, and again, those uh, cost an energy which is proportional to the distance of the boundary of the membrane. Okay, so let's put, put some of these ideas together. Uh, here we have a 2D Tor code, which is sitting inside um, two 3D Tor codes, which for now will be decoupled. So we'll have a 3D Tor code on the top and a 3D Tor code on the bottom and I'll describe some additional local relations that I will add to the theory in order to view this 2D Tor code as a defect sitting inside this three-dimensional uh, Tor code. Now, because I'm uh, fairly poor at drawing diagrams, I will project this into the two-dimensional plane. So in this picture, this thick black line here represents the two-dimensional Tor code um, which is coming in and out of the PowerPoint slide, and similarly for the 3D Tor code on top and bottom. Okay, so we want to understand uh, the defect that I'm building in terms of what can be locally created. So of course, in the bottom of this uh, picture, I can pair create E tilde anions for free, or topological excitations for free. Similarly, for the top of the picture, and we can also build these loop excitations that are at the boundary of membrane operators. 
Similarly, in this picture, we can pair create m particles of the 2D Tor code and pair create e particles of the 2D Tor code. <clears throat> now, in order to get uh, non trivial fracton physics, we have to couple these systems together in some non trivial way. All right, so on the left here, um, I have shown a 2D Tor code. Uh, with a certain type of boundary condition over the adjacent 3D Tor codes, which is just the blank space here. The boundary condition is such that the M tilde loop excitations uh, can only terminate on the M excitations of the 2D Tor code. Okay? Uh, so this is kind of like a flux condensing boundary uh, glued in with the 2D Tor code, if you prefer that language. The other kind of condensation we will uh, require is that pairs of E tilde particles from the adjacent 3D Tor codes um, become isomorphic to the E, the e excitation of the 2D Tor code. Okay. Uh, are there any questions about that boundary condition? Okay. So let's analyze what that boundary condition does for this uh, defect inside the 3D Tor code. So here we have an isolated E tilde particle. And we want to move this E tilde particle from the lower 3D Tor code to the upper 3D Tor code. Applying this relation here, which comes for free, that's what's being condensed on this boundary. Um, so we can create this triple of excitations out of the vacuum here for free, and then annihilate the bottom two E tilde excitations and find an E tilde in the upper 3D Tor code with an E left over. Okay, so we can shift uh, an E tilde excitation from the lower 3D Tor code to the upper 3D Tor code at the expense of leaving behind a 2D excitation. All right, any questions about that? Okay, so now we want to uh, really build our non-trivial defect network. And we're going to foliate space with 2D Tor codes. So here we have a layer of 2D torque codes uh, sitting in the Z direction. And then here a layer of 2D torque codes sitting in the X direction. And then again, a layer of 2D torque codes sitting in the Y direction. And then behind them on uh, all of the volumes that these cut out, we have a 3D torque code sitting there. And then at each interface, we introduce the boundary condition that I just discussed on the previous slide. Okay, so again, because I can't draw these 3D diagrams very well, I'm going to project them into the plane and analyze the physics there. So here, um, you can imagine that I've looked uh, just off the XY plane, and I uh, have intersected a layer of 3D Tor code cubes, which are described by these plaquettes here, and then each edge is describing a 2D Tor code that's coming out of the slide towards you. Okay, and then again, I place this boundary condition on each uh, 2D Tor code. Okay, is that picture clear? Great. Okay, so let's analyze the mobility of our isolated excitations. So here I have an E tilde excitation, which is isolated to this uh, volume of 3D Tor code. And it's very important that I have this boundary condition on every uh, edge. And let's ask what happens if we try to move it, uh, say, in this direction. Well, we saw that we can move this excitation over as long as we leave behind an E excitation using this rule here. And similarly, we can keep moving E tilde. However, at each point when we move it, we'll find we leave behind an E excitation. So what that tells us is that in isolation, these E tilde particles are confined to their respective 3D Tor codes. They cannot move freely in the system. They are fractons. All right. Now let's consider a pair of E tilde excitations. That's what we have here. And uh, move that pair of E tilde excitations over by uh, one unit cell. <coughs> okay. So we move it over by one unit cell, and 
we can only do that as long as we leave these E excitations behind, which is shown here. Uh, but those E excitations, they actually live on the same 2D toric code. So those E excitations can just pair annihilate by um, moving them together inside that 2D toric code. So that tells us that these E tilde excitations, pairs of them are actually planons. By symmetry, they can also move in the perpendicular direction or directions that, that is transverse to their dipole moment. And similarly, they can be pulled apart in the vertical direction um, using a similar process. Sure. I guess the reason I'm asking is that if you couple at like intersections, for instance, and then you change these, then I'd imagine you can. Ah, uh, yeah. So in this picture, one line represents the same 2D Tor code. Oh, uh, sorry. I guess I mean when they that intersects at a perpendicular. Like at a uh, vertex? Yeah, at a vertex. Can those two Tor codes that are intersecting interact? Uh, in this picture, no. They only interact through the three dimensional Tor code. If you allow interaction, could you then get this plane on the move in any direction? Um, potentially, there's probably there's probably there's many choices that you can place for the one-dimensional boundary condition, and it it may be possible to give it 3D mobility, but I, I'm not sure off the top of my head. Yeah, there's something like uh, if you look at the this defect network where you just have 3D Tor codes on every three cell, um, and then choose generic boundary conditions. Generic, but cons you know, standard digraph winning boundary conditions on the two and one cells. You find that there's something like 3,000 models that you can write down. And I've only analyzed a handful of them. OK, any other questions? All right. Um, <clears throat> so what about the M particles? Well, we can create a loop of M, uh, M tilde, I should say, inside one of these 3D Tor codes, and then push it into the boundary. And we have a pair of M particles uh, sitting apart from one another. And we may think that this forms a plane on. Um, so let's try moving them apart. Um, what you find is if you start moving them apart, you'll violate a linear number of plaquette terms as you start pushing them apart from one another. And so what this tells you is that the M particles are actually confined in this model. OK. But there are still non-trivial excitations associated with these M strings. So in particular, if you have an M string which connects um, these 2D toric codes here and here, then you'll find that this, op this uh, excitation which uh, costs less and less energy as you push it into the corner, but never zero, uh, cannot be removed by any of these uh, local excitations here. Um, and so therefore, it's a non-trivial topological excitation. And it has a mobility um, along the intersection of the two planes that it's uh, touching. Okay, so short M strings uh, are line-ons in this model. And for the same reason as before, line-on dipoles, as shown here, so short strings of line-ons straddling these two 2D Tor codes, uh, create planons in the transverse direction. Okay, what about the fusion rules of these line-ons? Well, uh, here's a 3D picture of this 3D Tor code volume, and inside that 3D picture, we create a loop of M tilde. Um, which is a local excitation. We can create it for free out of the vacuum. And then push that M tilde into the uh, Tor codes that are living at the boundaries of this cube here. And there we find uh, three line-on types that live on the three coordinate axes, just like we had in the Tor code. Sorry, X cube model. OK. Yeah, and this picture down here is just showing how uh, one line-on can be through a similar process transformed into the two line-ons on the other coordinate direction. Okay, so this shows the phenomenology of, these, of the X cube model is uh, identical to the phenomenology of this defect network I just described. 
Um, it turns out you can very explicitly write down a commuting vector model for this Hamiltonian. In fact, down many of them. It's not unique. Uh, but they all give the same physics. And um, if you make a judicious choice, then you can show that it's actually unitarily equivalent to this X cubed model. We do that explicitly in our paper if you want to find more details. OK, so that's the end of that example. Are there any questions about that? It's TQFT with defects. Yeah, you could, well, I'm not sure. That's out of my pay grade. So, um, yeah, I guess the, yeah, I, I shouldn't comment. Pardon? Yeah, I agree. So there, there, it's more like a, a three category for the three strata and a module three, a bi-module category for the three categories on the two strata, and then a higher module category on the one strata, roughly. So I'm waiting for mathematicians to define that for me, and then I'll apply it later. But you know, it, 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 if you go to the literature, it's hard to pin down definitions that are practical and you know, useful for doing computations. But yeah, that's the right idea. Continue the question. So let's do something we know. So suppose we do exactly what we did, reduce one dimension. Mm -hmm. Two D power code one square that is but they keep on recondition all the horizontal ones and condition on the sure. vertical ones. You probably need to choose something at the vertical. That's right. So yeah, so you can ask what Yeah, what do we get? What so yeah, what what kind of yeah, so so it's pretty subtle actually. Um, there are natural choices you can make for the two strata boundary conditions and the one strata boundary conditions. For the zero strata boundary conditions, you choose um, an idempotent in this endomorphism algebra. And that basically amounts to projecting onto a certain uh, topological charge coming from the uh, adjacent three, two, and one strata. So there's, n there's not many choices for what you can place at the zero strata. Yeah, in two, in two dimensions, it's the same. So at the zero strata, you can project onto the vacuum E, M, or Psi. Well, I'm thinking the vertex, could I make that even more on a zero node, or can you not make it? Well, with the boundary condition that you just described? Those are all E boundary conditions, vertical, all M. And then you can choose Yeah, so. You can do it in a way so that there is no degeneracy, I think. You, you can definitely do it in a way so that there is degeneracy as well, but then it, you know, it won't be a gap phase. It won't be gap. Uh, yeah, it, there'll be extensive degeneracy. Okay. Uh, I try to decide if one dimension of that word that was two or square root two. Do you think you have a choose and make a square root two? Uh, I would have thought it's four, because you'll have like four Majoranas. Yeah. Colleen? I, yeah, I feel like it, uh, maybe I haven't called it that, but it could be that uh, you know mathematicians would want to call it a Morita context. If it may be, uh, do the in a Morita context, do the defects have to be invertible? Okay. Yeah. Uh, and when you define the TQFT from a Morita context? It's about two categories. Fusion two categories or just? OK. There is, so a, maybe... no, there is a notion of non-degenerate braided fusion two categories. Uh -huh. I mean, non-degenerate braided one category is the same as modular. It's kind of next 
stage. Okay. Yeah, I think, and it was proposed by Johnson Frey to describe this topological, uh, the dimensional topological order. Maybe this is the definition you are looking for. Maybe. It, it makes good sense to me. It would be great. Yeah. Okay. I guess one subtle thing is that in the TQFT, we would often fluctuate over all the defects. In this case, I want them to be frozen. Okay. So uh, what are the benefits and drawbacks of the defect network? Well, one benefit is that it divides this uh, complicated fracton physics into more tractable TQFT pieces that we can analyze uh, by hand or on a computer. Um, it separates the microscopic details. You know, when I was describing the defect network, I didn't actually have to refer to a lattice model in order to define it. It could be defined purely diagrammatically. Um, and it may be able to help us uh, construct new uh, topological orders and also help characterize them. Okay, and then I think I'll skip this slide, but it, it's just reiterating the same pictures that I've been talking about. So on the three strata, we're assigning three plus one ETQFT. The two strata, we're assigning uh, bimodules over those three plus one ETQFTs. And then on the one strata, sort of a higher order module and then the zero strata are essentially determined by pinning a topological charge. Okay, and with that, I'd like to say thanks. And uh, if you want more details on this specific construction, you can check out these papers.